All right, everybody. Well, welcome to uh, the I-10 Second Thursday event. Uh, excited for, for how many we have to show up and, and sign up today. Uh, today we have uh, Mark Graphic Meeting presenting from Kara Stone. Uh, Kara Stone has been uh, a sponsor of some of I-10 stuff for quite some time, including the, uh, the virtual digital map uh, that you guys, if you guys haven't seen that, Connie will post that in the chat sometime after a bit. Um, Mark is the founder and managing partner of Kara Stone. As I mentioned, it's a national law for, firm focused on tra transactional law, securities, and corporate litigation. Uh, he's been selected as a super lawyer in the field of securities law for many years in a row and has significant experience representing public and private companies. I uh, successfully represented clients through various rounds of financing, exits, crisis management, uh, and scaling up. Many of his clients have had successful exit, exits, and he's worked on over 20 venture stage deals a year, um, with Carastone representing clients over a billion dollars in 2018. In addition to being a lawyer, Mark is a partner at Calais Capital Ventures, a Series A venture capital fund investing in the central, Midwest, and Southeast regions of the U.S., so this is a very relevant conversation for anyone in the region looking to learn more about what venture capital looks like and, and what they should be focused on uh, getting their companies in order for uh, to, to potentially take advantage of that. Without further ado, I will hand things over to Mark. If you guys have any questions while he is presenting, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll, we'll address them as we go. Uh, otherwise, we'll also have some Q&A at the end. All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good to be back here again at Venture Cafe. Um, again, I'm Mark Graffinini. I am the founder and managing partner of Carestone. And at Carestone, we are a boutique firm that cover investors and companies nationwide doing angel and venture capital deals and exits. So we're, we're primarily a transaction-based law firm. Uh, over the last 10 years since starting my own firm, I've done well over 450 plus angel and venture deals um, as a lawyer, well over a billion dollars worth of those kinds of transactions. Um, I've deployed uh, as an angel investor, several million dollars worth of capital, and then through a partner and a fund, I'm doing that too. So to, you know, to put it into framework, we're the kind of uh, firm that basically a lot of companies turn to when they're starting to deal with, you know, professional venture capital organizations, organized uh, groups like incubators, accelerators, angel, angel funds, or, angel networks and those kinds of things. We also help companies with um, transitioning from LLC to C-Corp, et cetera. And what I've gathered from doing, you know, this many deals over this kind of period of time, um, I started doing these at Silicon Valley at the, the largest law firm out there. And I was involved with a lot of companies um, in, in various stages, including big public companies, is that the more information you have about the deal market, the more likely you are to get terms that are good for you and your company as a founder, and ultimately actually for the investors too. So uh, the venture capital market, unlike the public company stock market, where you can see stock prices and get instant real-time information about what's happening, is a lot harder to figure out for people. And even the most successful founders on earth, many times have only done at best a handful of startups, which means, if they've done five rounds for every startup, they've done 25 deals in their lifetime. Many lawyers, even ones at big firms, might do one to five venture deals, true venture deals in a year. Um, and in many cases, we're doing that much in a month. And so uh, you'll hear a lot in deals about what kind of terms are standard, what companies of you know about your stage can do and not do. And there's an information asymmetry a lot of times. And then what is out there is oftentimes coming from blogs that are based either in Silicon Valley or New York, which really aren't all that applicable to markets in the central U.S. like Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, other markets that I cover as a lawyer in a VC. So what we're trying to get you to do as you embark on a fundraising strategy, or if you're a professional or a VC in it, is to start focusing more on the actual metrics that apply to any given market. And like I'm saying, even if you're uh, an active practitioner in an area, or even if you're an active VC, um, your deal experience in any given year might not even be representative of your particular market. And so there's a lot of education, I think, that needs to happen in various ecosystems, and that's one of the things we're trying to do. And what this kind of data can do is help your business fundraise strategically. It can help investors and companies better come to terms more quickly, reducing transaction costs. It helps founders paint the company's story with investors and tie their metrics in 
to things like valuation and other discussions. And it can set some realistic expectations for the founding team since a lot of people get into this not only to do good in the world, but also uh, to make a lot of money in the end. And so what I'd like to start off with today is something that I don't think has really been closely analyzed for markets outside of Silicon Valley. And that's what kind of, of what, what are the major deal terms that are happening across rounds? And this slide kind of presupposes that you know some of this terminology. So I'm gonna quickly try to run through what some of these mean as I tell you what the stats are. But in most given investor deals with venture capital groups or formalized angel groups, you're selling as a founder or a company preferred stock. And that preferred stock has certain rights that are that go along with it. One of them is are what's called dividends, which is like an interest rate kind of on the money that gets invested. And these can be either cumulative dividends, so like maybe you have an 8% dividend rate, which is cumulative, meaning each year it gets added to the principal, the investment amount, or it can be non-cumulative, means it only gets applied when, as, and if declared by the board of directors. And what I found pretty interesting about the St. Louis market is that 80% of the deals that are done for preferred stock have a cumulative dividend feature, which is actually really not standard in most other markets, at least where I've been active. So in Silicon Valley, it's almost unheard of to have a cumulative dividend standard. In Louisiana, same thing. In Tennessee, it's a little bit uh, less, less dramatic. But in this term, it looks like to me, the St. Louis market is actually much more similar to what you might find in a New, York, a New York, historical New York East Coast venture market where investors are getting a cumulative like percentage on their money invested each year, regardless of whether or not the board declares that. I found that pretty telling. The com uh, it, much like an interest rate on a loan, a dividend rate can also be compounding or non-compounding. And the stats here are pretty, pretty good. Um, basically 100% of deals are non-compounding, which means it doesn't accrue and add up to the principal and then get 8% on it each year. So that's a pretty good thing for companies, um, but it's something to keep, up, keep a lookout on your deal. The other term that was a little bit surprising to me is what's called the participation preference of the preferred stock. So when an investor buys preferred stock in a company, if it's participating preferred stock, it means that at exit, the investor gets their money back, plus they get whatever percentage of the company that they bought. Let's say it's 10%. So they would, if you put in a million dollars, you get a million dollars back, plus you get 10% of the upside proceeds. Non-participating preferred stock is preferred stock that has to choose between either getting your money back plus your dividends or getting your percentage of the company. And it's designed basically to say, look, investor, we'll give you downside protection, but we're not necessarily going to let you have your cake and eat it too, or double dip and get your money back and also get a percentage of the company. Historically, in Silicon Valley, you will it's very rare to see a participating preferred stock at all. I almost never did deals with participating preferred stock unless it was like a down round or in the recession. In Louisiana, same thing, I think probably maybe 10% of deals overall and almost none of our clients give on this term um, if they're performing well. But in the St. Louis market is about 60% of deals actually have participating preferred uh, versus 40% non-participating. And that's an area where um, it was pretty surprising to me. It seems like, again, there are some pretty investor favorable things. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. There are certainly valid reasons for investment groups to ask for those kinds of things. And I should point out here that you know, our data sample on this is pretty broad. It's uh, over 30 companies and I think more than 130 or 30 deals or so. Um, so it's a pretty broad spread group and it's companies that were invested in by a lot of the different funds in the area and uh, a good portion of which had some exits. So I think it is pretty representative, although I should point out again that we're in the process of adding even more and some of those things may change. But I think when you're going into deals as a founder, you're going to have lawyers involved that maybe got referred to you by different uh, investor groups or accelerators, and they may have a viewpoint on what's standard and what's not. Uh, their view of what's standard in the market may vary based on their experience in the market, how many deals they do, how many things they see, and, and really who ends up becoming a bigger source of business. My point of view on this is that if you look across nationally and in, in the most active venture markets, you will not see cumulative dividends or participating preferred stock 
in as many deals necessarily as you, as you see here. Um, redemption rights are the right of an investor to basically sell their stock back to the company to get out, to force an exit after five years. And in the deals that we looked at, there were, um, I think 26% of deals where they were included and 74% where they're not included. So the vast majority of deals do not have these, but about a quarter do. That's pretty high. Um, this protective provisions thing needs a little work, so I won't go too into that, but most deals in the venture context actually do have protective provisions, which basically are the rights of the investor to approve certain kinds of actions by the company after they invest. So investors are not just buying in economically to uh, companies, they're also buying certain kinds of control rights, or at least veto rights over certain things. So the key takeaway here is that when you're going into rounds, knowing where your market fits, knowing precisely where your potential investors fit is a huge information advantage to knowing how to trade on some of these rights for maybe a higher valuation or vice versa and, and how to get what you want strategically. And it's important that you have access to people, I think, as you're going through this process who look at not just the local market, but their particular investors can pull information from their various deals to make sure you keep them in check and then also keep a global perspective because ultimately a lot of companies do have to go outside of their home market to raise money and not understanding these things puts you at a distinct disadvantage in any of those kinds of negotiations. Understanding those things will really, really help you be credible to investors and get the terms you want. Um, another thing that I, we, we've looked at, and again, this is uh, this data, it's a little bit maybe hard to read, but there's three key takeaways here. And a lot of founders, and, and I'm not, I mean, I think even a lot of investors don't necessarily know this because there, there just aren't that many people outside of Silicon Valley that, that are really doing exits regularly uh, for these kinds of startup companies. So in any given round, I think a good rule of thumb is that a company is gonna sell anywhere from 10% on the low end to about 33% on the high end. If things are going really well and the company is looking good for in whatever market it, it is in particularly. So one of the things that we looked at when we looked at cross deals, like we looked at how much common stock uh, the founders own relative to investors across deals over periods of time. And one of the things I noticed is that in companies that look like they've done multiple convertible notes and safes rounds, the, there was significant dilution of the founding class between the formation of the company and the Series A. So for example, in deals where a company did a Series seed, they were generally selling about 33% of the company in that seed round. The founders were owning 67%, where they had done multiple convertible type instruments like notes and safes, things like that leading up to their A round and all those converted. Founders were often only owning about 46% of the company at Series A. This is pretty staggering to me, actually. So it, it, we've done several videos on whether or not you want to do uh, convertible notes or safes or things like that. Um, and it's important that you understand the economics of them because the truth is things like valuation caps uh, in notes and safes were not a standard feature for many years when those instruments were introduced. They became more commonly accepted as different accelerator groups and really in the context of the recession where notes were mostly used between rounds and it was a way for investors to hedge risks. But because there's been a startup explosion in the last 10 years after all of those, after the, the great recession, I think that these valuation caps have become the norm. I think founders are giving up way too much uh, at the conversion and the A. It's crazy to me that a 46% founders, or founders would own 46% versus 67% by doing just a normal seed round. I think another thing that um, that's very clear in the data is that in general, the your, your rule of thumb is probably not 10 to 32%, 10% of a company. If you're only selling 10% in your round, that's an outlier. Really most of the deals fall between 20 and 32% of the company being sold in each round of financing. So the point being that Founders and investors tend to really obsess over the valuation number. They're very often within 10 to 12% of one another on this number. 
I think everybody does themselves some degree of disservice by going crazy on the exact number when they're already in that 12%. There are sometimes more important things to do, more important things to focus on, like the work relationship between the parties. You know, how are they going to make the company success successful going forward, et cetera. And I think I think that's the important, important takeaway there for, for a good marketing, good fundraising and negotiating strategy. The third takeaway to me from some of the data that we're looking at is that an exit a lot of the companies that we evaluated, the total common stock owned by the founders at exit was approximately 30%. So if you're a founder in a company, let's say you have three co-founders and the average is 30% at exit among all the founders, on average, that means any one founder is going to have 10% of the exit value. The way I always look at it is if you're a founder and you have between 10 and 20% at a substantial exit, that's a pretty good place to be. 20% is pretty exceptional. So I think things that look like they're pretty much in line in that in that sense on the valuation going forward. Um, but I do think that founders need to really be careful and not just keep repeating the maybe incorrect uninformed data analysis of whether or not convertible instruments versus equity rounds are better off for, for a company or a founder. Because I think that this has become sort of something that people don't question the assumptions and the data is 100% clear, at least in the deals that we look at nationally and, and, and in any given market. So th th when we publish this stuff, this, is gonna, this graph is gonna be a little bit better, but I wanna talk a little bit about valuation increase between rounds, because again, you, you find uh, everybody involved in these deals in various markets, sort of, I think, focusing on some of the wrong things. There's oftentimes a real sense of founders, and then they get told this by people that are mentors and service providers, et cetera, that one of the reasons, for example, not to really do a valuation in your first round is because you may you may like get way too low valuation. That amount that you sold could be worth millions down the road. Most of the time, the math does not support this. So if you look at the numbers and you look at valuation increases between rounds and you look at the valuation on average from A to the exit multiple or the last round multiple, you're gonna see that the most gains are made between A and B and B and C, and there's not that much gain between C and D. And the, and the gain between series C and series A is pretty, you know, it's not huge. It's not as much as the gain between series A and series B. But like I said before, people are often within 10% of each other there anyway. So a couple of takeaways here. Number one, the negotiation or evaluation at the early stage, like, whether or not you're going to do a valuation cap of X or a series C valuation of X, it's important, but it is not usually the end all be all. It is not the most important valuation metric. There are often other points in the company's history where it becomes a little bit more important. So if you look at deals between series A and series B, on average, there's about 120% price differential or increase. So in other words, series B pays 120% more than the Series A investors. The Series C investors typically are paying about 110% more than the Series B investors. And then Series D or later are paying about 36% markup to the, to, the, uh, to the B round. So, and that makes sense, right? If you're investing later, your price isn't gonna appreciate as much because the risk is less and, and things like that. So it, it, to, to some degree, I think the, the point I'm trying to make here is if you're going into these discussions and you don't have the right data points, you may really be turning down good deals based on information that doesn't really pan out in the wrong, wrong long run. And I see this happen all the time with companies that, that just don't get good advice where they're like, you know, you really got to focus on this one number or metric at this point in time because this is the crucial time and, and they're just not data supporting it. Whereas sometimes the most important thing for a company to do is get a good, a pretty good deal done, hit their key milestones and metrics, rather than select only investors that give the highest absolute valuation or the highest cap, take longer to close a whole round, longer to hit your milestones. The thing that will kill a company invariably, without a doubt, I have 500 data points to prove it at least, are the things that drag out your financing strategies and make you lag on milestone and performance indicators. They are simply not tied to whether or not you were like the A plus gold star student in terms of your series A valuation or your series, series C valuation. 
and, and, and really I defy just about anybody to come up with data that denies that because it's, it's, it's overwhelmingly clear in what we look at. In, in terms of the ecosystem, I think this is also important because there's not an ecosystem in, in the US today that I, I, I speak at one of these events or I talk to people involved where they don't say like, oh, there's barely any uh, funding options here. It's really hard. It is really hard to get funding. That's, that's the whole point I'm trying to make. And if you go in without data and understanding the market, understanding where you fit into things, you're really at a disadvantage. If you're working with people who know this stuff in theory and not in practice, you are really at a disadvantage. So if you look at the market, for example, uh, in St. Louis, and you look at a 10 year period, you're talking about about 700 deals, more or less 70 deals per year, um, a couple billion dollars in total uh, raise, about 215 million raise. And that may seem like, oh, you may be like, all right, I have like a one in 70 chance or a one in 75 chance. That is incorrect because that 75 represents all kinds of segments and sectors. And as you probably have already figured out, you don't met maybe in, in the St. Louis or Missouri market have, you know, five biotech investors and five SaaS investors. You maybe have two or you maybe have one. Then in Chicago, they have one or two and other, other places. So point I'm trying to make is it's really important to adequately handicap your chances of raising money and understand that it's not even a one in 100 chance. It's usually like a one in three or one in five chance or even less because every fund has specific metrics that they got to they got to figure out. They have specific areas of expertise that they know better than others. They have LPs that want to, want to see certain things of them. So the chances are really hard. You have to cast a broad net. You have to know which, and, and the same goes true in Silicon Valley. It wasn't like uh, when I was in Silicon Valley, everybody was just running down the street, getting checks into. It's very hard there too. Very competitive, even though the amount of deal flow there is orders of magnitude bigger than a, than a state like Missouri or some of these other states where, where where we're active. And the point I'm trying to make is you got to go in there, you got to understand what the what the groups that are going to be funding deals in your market or your region like. You have to know which ones work well together, which ones syndicate well together. And that really only comes from either doing a bunch of these with a lot of parties, or it comes from knowing the data cold and kind of understanding how they get structured. So uh, I think when you're determining your chances of funding and you're trying to put yourself into a category, you know, you also need to understand that any given portfolio of a fund is constructed in a certain manner. So if there's a generalist fund and they're gonna invest in 10 companies over a three year period or something like that, they're gonna have like their own internal guides to how to have, here's how many SaaS companies you want, here's how many e-commerce companies, here's how many of this or that. So it, it's not enough to just know that fund has X amount of dollars or this high net worth person has this amount of dollars they could invest. It's, you've gotta understand a little bit more I think about how the investing world look at, it looks at a market, how they look at a portfolio, and then you can help start pitching people on what it is that you're doing and how it fits into their strategy, which is you know, not something that, that everybody learns. It's one thing that you have to do, which is pitch your business and how well it's working with the traction you have, et cetera. But it's another thing that you need to do where you need to explain like, here's what my market for exits look like. Here are the companies that have exited in my market. Here's how it fits into your portfolio strategy of looking for cer certain numbers, et cetera. So if you go into that, people understand that, you know, they have other people's money, they're entrusting it with you. You're communicating to them that you have their money and you ultimately are trying to provide them and their investors with value. And it's a lot easier for a VC to understand why you're gonna be a good steward of their capital versus other opportunities. So, you know, the, the, the setting yourself up for success definitely involves thinking about your exit strategy early. I, I know that when I, when I am having my VC hat on, there are a lot of companies, and these are often ones that have gotten like, you know, a decent amount of seed funding. And they're, they're like taking a strategy where they're like, they're doing big seed rounds and they're, and they, they're somewhat like dismissive of like, what are your exit plans or strategy? How do you see this going? Like it's too early to tell that. I'm just testing out lots of things. You know, we're really raising money to like show that we can be transformative. That may work with some funds. Like in particular, if you're talking to funds on the East and West Coast, I think that story is more sellable because that's like the narrative, even though I don't think that's the actual reality of how investing is working there. That fits into certain narratives. I think you're gonna have a hard time getting really solid support 
in the central U.S. region if that's how you look at this game. I think number two, you've got to know the deal day in your market. If you don't, you may be spending your time going through due diligence process with funds that are not likely to get there, but will definitely you know, be interested in learning more about what you're doing. And I think you need to know how to really target the right funds in order to succeed. If you do not do that, you're going to have a really hard time. I see, I see, I see good companies all the time where the founders seem to get in their mind, like, I'm going to reach out to like 50 or a hundred funds with like a cold email. It's a numbers game. I can get there. I can tell you 100% they're getting bad advice. Whoever's doing that. There is definitely a sales aspect and a pipeline strategy of fundraising. But it is very unlikely if you're just sending cold emails to people on that kind of basis, or it, or what it communicates probably is that something's already gone wrong and people you know have already passed, and now you're just kind of taking a shot in the dark. But I've been disappointed to see companies even um, that I've been introduced to kind of take that strategy. I'm just it kind of blows my mind. So you need people that can like have enough data points. You need to know how many how many deals they've been associated with. I think before you're you're listening to some of that advice out there. Um, in terms of average and median deal sizes, you know these range, but I think it's helpful for people to know that it's probably smaller than you think. So on average, which includes the really big later stage rounds, there's about a 5.3 million dollar deal size. The median is much closer to two million. So more deals happen in that two million dollar range than any other number. That's even kind of high, and I think there's some aspect to this where people are like, I see this in every market where people are like, you know, well, I, I read that people are doing five, 10, $50 million series A's and Silicon Valley. Some companies do, but not that many. I, I can tell you they don't. So you, you'll see more often than not um, at the seed stage, even Silicon Valley funds that are affiliated, like seed stage funds that are affiliated with, you know, big multi-billion dollar funds, very few groups write bigger than $500,000 checks at the seed stage. You know, prove, prove me wrong if you want, but that's that's a fact. And I think the second thing is you, you, you when people refer to seed, they, they may be referring to two or three seed deals within there. So like, I think more often than not, what I see are companies that have done one or two seed rounds before they get to A. So they might do 500,000 to, they might start off doing 250 to 500,000. They might prove out some models then do another 500 to one and a half million dollar round. So they've raised $2 million to go together in their seed round. And then by their A, they're raising some amount. So um, in, in A rounds, you know, for, for very top performing companies, like if you're a company doing millions in revenue and you're growing a triple digit growth rates year over year, you'll start getting into the eight, 10, $15 million series A round. If you're not doing that, I'm not saying you can't raise it. I see it sometimes. But it's very rare. It's very, very rare. It, it also, to me, has been highly correlated with companies that just don't make it because maybe they've raised at such a really high valuation, but they have a lack of traction metrics and they didn't, you know, they didn't verify that what some of these seed guys that were getting into the round early with big amounts or big check sizes was going to pan out. Like, I guess, you know, sometimes people think that they're going to flip a switch and go from zero in revenue because they've, they've reached scale and then all of a sudden it's going to be 10 million. I have not seen this strategy work ever. <laughs> it's not to say that it won't. It's not to say that you can't go from freemium immediately to a big number, but it's rare. I have worked with a number of companies that have done $300 million plus exits and none of them had that strategy. They all track revenue from early stages, improved on things, improved on growth metrics, and that's what led to an exit. I have yet to work with a company anywhere, Silicon Valley or here, where you know this kind of mystical strategy has has succeeded. Um, Mark, with, there's a question about valuation in the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to take it now, since you were talking about that, but um, mm -hmm. just about how can you choose which milestones are pr predictive of a justifiable increase in valuation? Yeah, I mean, not in this data set, but we have others that that I, it so. There are going to be key metrics associated with any business. And I think it, it is not, and again, there are always exceptions to every rule. So there are definitely companies I'm intimately aware of that do, don't have traditional great growth metrics to pitch when they're pitching. 
and they're really pitching a, a, what they you know are pitching as like a, a giant transformative thing and they're kind of like you know they're I, I, they're they're they maybe have had success in the past or have people on the sales team that are really good at enterprise sales and they believe they have a good chance of getting you know massive enterprise kind of level contracts that then can really get revenue big those are a particular kind of company it's so rare that you come across those that those are individualized deals it's very rare that a founder that's never exited before can can credibly pitch this in my opinion if you're every other founder that hasn't exited for a big amount before and or has done that in the past as part of a key executive team almost everyone else is going to be judged on things like user met metrics revenue growth um you know that that kind of stuff well i mean it's not that popular to say but 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 that is, that's it when everybody talks about like great transformations and disruptions to some degree they're obfuscating the reality that people are trying to invest in saleable businesses that that have growth metrics and you know that's what it's about for the most part there are exceptions to every rule you know there are teslas and amazons and other companies that that maybe show losses and um but there are also we works that are selling things that just the market doesn't support. And most investors want to invest in things that a market, a rational market will support, if that makes sense. Mark, Mark there was also a question about the uh, the source of this content for the presentation itself. Is this Missouri? Is this St. Louis region? It's, you know. It's is all Missouri. So, um, you know, we collect the data from a variety of sources, but it's, it's, it's public and private information. It's database based. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we get a combination of data for every market that we look at. Um, we pull original source documents for deals. We pull things like SEC form data. We look at all the different databases that cover the stuff where you need a subscription and we make our own. So like, I, you know, a lot of the stuff that's commercially available for subscriptions, they just kind of pull um, based on different bots and scrapers and, and feeds and things like that. It's not very well curated. So we go in and do that when we yeah. look at it. And we do and, it for and, Yeah. And I think I saw it on one of the other slides. Um, you, for everybody, just to reiterate, you can actually go view this data yourself uh, on Carestone's website. I think it's vc.carestone.com. Is that right? Yeah. Um, doing here's, it from memory. Yeah. Here's here's the website, vc.carestone.com. It doesn't have all the deal term stuff that we just kind of previewed here. And, you know, think of that as like, you know, maybe when the stand-up goes and tests some new material, it's pretty reliable. I know that we've, you know, sliced and diced a bunch of ways and we've looked at the original source documents for all this stuff, but there's more to come there. So like, you know, I think I, I'll feel much better about the integrity of some of those numbers once, I think we can double kind of the number that we've looked at in the next several months. But I know that these deals are pretty representative of the better deals that have happened there. Let's put it that way. So yeah, these are Missouri wide. Um, and, and you can look at some of this data yourself about like the number of deals and median deal sizes, C corps versus LLCs, stuff like that at the vc.carison site. Does um, the website also have comparing to other er areas of the country? Can we look at- Search individual ones. I don't think we, have yet the capability to like compare. Right. You're not like Home Depot. We're looking for, you know, a, a grill or whatever where you can compare four or five. We, we, <laughs> <They're young. laughs> we do it actually. So like we, you know, we look at, for example, what the cities are. So St. Louis by far raises more okay. money than the city. Um, we look at the industry and then like, so as a VC partner, I cover uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, um, Missouri, Oklahoma. You know, to me, it's the most interesting because Tennessee and Georgia, for example, uh, they have so like Missouri and Louisiana are actually surprisingly high performers, I think, for the quality and number of companies that get funded and exit versus some of these other bigger places. And I think there's different reasons for that. You know, these were like nor like both New Orleans and St. Louis have had a long history of centers and hubs of commerce. And I think they're able to draw upon some of that, for example, 
and, and doing this stuff. So yeah, we we will get this play, this to a place where I think you know different ecosystem groups of founders can run a lot of comparisons between markets and companies across markets. Um, but it's a work in progress, and you know, like I'm saying, it's it's something we do, you know, without monetization because I think it comes out in the values that we're able to negotiate for for clients. But it is a lot of work, so we're just but we're obsessed with it. <laughs> so, um, it'll never be perfect, too. That's the other thing you have to accept with it. Let me see. You can't let great get in the way of good, right? That's uh, you know. <laughs> They, I mean, the truth is, like, uh, it doesn't take that many to really be pretty representative when you're talking about, you know, 70 deals a year or something like that. You, you can you can get pretty good information from 30 companies across 100 and something deals. So I think it I think it is pretty it's going to be pretty accurate. With yeah. You know, yeah. I know I know I covered a lot of like pretty. I don't know how much people have been introduced to some of these deal terms. Happy to ask and answer any questions uh, on that front too. Like, if, if anybody, you know, can you explain participating or anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love for you to dive a little bit more, Mark, into the, you know, your points that you were making about, I think, safes and convertible notes becoming kind of the standard right path that people are taking and the valuation hit that owners are taking based on that, you know, in the lifespan of the company. I'd love for you to hear to hear more about that and and just kind of dive into like how to navigate that in your opinion, I guess, for these companies, right? Well, and I, I, like, I, I keep laughing because I, I, I think I'm coming off sometimes as like an anti-note safe person. And I'm like, I'm definitely not. I think there's good uses. We do a ton of them all the time, but I, I definitely am like against like just jumping to the conclusion and going like, all right, we just, we do a safe. And, and I also, I get bummed out too sometimes when some of the, you know, the leaders of various groups, they're like, that's what we do. And that's just how it is. And like, you know, it just kind of crushes me because I'm always like, I, I get that, you know, nobody wants to spend a lot of money in these early stage deals, nor should they be. And that's another part of my point is like people that know what they're doing aren't going to, it's not going to cost any difference between a safe and a note and a series seed for somebody that does a lot of these regularly. It's going to be negligible. So I think the key point I'm trying to make is just do the math. Like if, if, if you're like, should I take a three and a half million dollar, you know, actual valuation now versus like, I have to close one person at 150 with a, a $2 million valuation cap and then another person at 300, like those fundraising strategy choices make a big difference too. They make it much more costly at the A to deal with all the conversion calculations and, and draft that stuff in the legal documents. And it also gets messier the founders are a little bit stunted in dealing with shareholders and boards probably than their peers who have like taken on shareholders and gotten in the habit and rhythm of reporting to them and boards. So there's a lot that goes into it. I just think people should really think about it a little bit more. I think that same thing, like I think, you know, accelerators out there, some of these accelerators have become very expensive for founders in terms of equity. Like, you know, they're, they're some are taking immediately 7% of the common stock plus, um, plus like a safe and a warrant where they put some money in. And, and I think that's steep. Like, and the, the attitude is definitely like, take it or leave it, kid, get out of here. And that also breaks my heart as somebody who advocates and negotiates for founders because that's the steepest round they're going to do. And those are the ones that by series A, those founders are going to have like 40% of the company. I mean, and, and I'm not sure, at least in my experience, I'm not sure that those are more highly correlated with actual exit. So I think people need to question some of this stuff and say, oh, there are, are there alternatives? Can I use alternatives as a negotiating strategy if I'm a founder or company versus these other groups, et cetera? Um, so that's my suggestion, basically. Yeah, and Claire just shared that you guys have a convertible note versus equity calculator to help figure out that long-term impact. That's really awesome. So that link's in the, in the chat there. And then Doug says, our SPACs become an incredible exit strategy for venture capital. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what you mean by the term credible, but some people like are, are cynics of any kind of non-traditional IPO, although there are many forms of IPOs. Like, you know, for example, Spotify did what's called a direct listing IPO. And a lot of people thought that that was like not a real one because no investment bankers underwrote it. And so maybe that's less credible than if, one of the big investment banks 
sells your stock to institutional investors. Some people deride SPACs and reverse mergers because, um, you know, may be seen as like an easy way. I can tell you it's not a cheap way to go public. Um, and I think, I, I personally think it is a viable and good option to have on the table for those of us in the, in the central section of the U.S. Because it, what it means is that there's basically a pot of cash for companies that are not necessarily making a lot of revenue that used to be able to go public on something like the NASDAQ where it was accepted to not have certain key things of public markets one and it was understood that you were in a growth phase and people were buying and holding long term. This provides a vehicle that's been sorely lacking primarily because of changes in Sarbanes-Oxley. So in 2009, 2010, the big debate in Silicon Valley was, well, companies can't go public anymore uh, in smaller IPOs on NASDAQ because it's too expensive. So should we start taking them public on things like the alternative investment market in London or Toronto, uh, the, the TMX in, in Canada? And those weren't great options because of liquidity. I mean, I, the, the deal I did in 2018 for Waiter was a SPAC IPO deal. And there were a lot of good things about it. And there were some bad things about it. I think no matter what, the other thing about IPO exits are there, it's not like that's the exit either. You know, everybody's locked up for six months minimum, sometimes a year or more. So Wader's a good example where the, you know, the, the, the sticker price was 308 million in less than a year, the valuation of the company is one and a half billion. And now it's about 300 million again. Right. So it's not, it's not the end in, in that company in particular, was a good example of a non-Silicon Valley based company that grew like crazy. And in four years, it went public in that reached a million and a half, a billion and a half dollar valuation. And then it's gone down, but you know, that's the kind of ride you're going to expect if you take a growth, uh, growth company public. Can you define SPAC for people really quick? Yeah. There too? Special purpose acquisition company. So it's like a, it's a shell basically um, that's never really had any activities and it has sponsors that have raised from their you know, institutional or high net worth sources money. So the one that I was involved with, you know, had like uh, Tillman Fertitta, who owns the Rock Houston Rockets and a bunch of restaurants and the chairman of CEO, uh, chairman CEO of Jeffrey's Investment Bank. They had put a SPAC together. They were looking for, you know, like a food and beverage kind of company or tech company to take public. Um, and that was, that's what happened there. So, yeah, I think it's a valuable option. There are a bunch of energy and materials companies going public. Uh, there are some biotech companies. It, it should be among the mix. It's not going to be the right fit for every deal, but it, it's a nice quiver, a nice, you know, I already have a quiver, I think. The next, next question I saw, there was just somebody asking uh, for more definition around the term convertible note. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So convertible note is an investment by an investor under basic, what's technically a debt instrument, but the money that they invest under that, that promissory note or debt instrument is intended by everyone to convert into stock of the company or, you know, membership interests of your LLC. And it usually has conversion terms that give them a cheaper price than the investors in your next round. So it's, it, you know, it's a good way to induce someone, like say somebody comes to, you know, a, a famous angel or an angel they think is going to add a lot of strategic value and they really want that person to get on board and that person might want a better term because they think they improve the company's odds of getting a series A done. That's a classic example of like a node scenario where you're basically giving the investor a little bit better deal than the next group that comes in. Um, you know, it also was, it's also historically been used between rounds. So like maybe the company has a shortfall that it didn't expect or, or it's looking at some strategic growth opportunity between an A and a B round, and it doesn't have the money in the bank and it wants to get some, it might do, it might do something and say, look, funds that are here, new fund that's interested, come on in, you'll get a little bit better deal. If we pull this off, it's gonna be great for the next one. You will have you know saved some money by doing this note. Um, convertible notes have become like an early stage seed vehicle too. Not that they weren't always, but I think more so now than, than when I first started doing this. Uh, you know, people will, will, will do these sometimes and, and say uh, it's a quicker way to get funded. It's less documentation, things like that. I don't know if that's the best explanation, but. 
Yeah, I think that was good. I'd be also interested, Mark, in, in so based on the, the slides, if I interpreted them correctly, we're seeing, you know, year over year, you kind of showed a number of deals and then also a, an amount of deals. We're seeing number of deals go down, but value of deals go up is what I quickly gleaned from that. Is that, do you think that's accurate? What do you think kind of that looks like as far as kind of the forecast going forward? I don't know if Claire wants to, I, I didn't look at, usually that's one of the things I look at pretty closely. I didn't look at it that much here because I, all this new fun stuff on valuation increases in terms were getting my, my attention more because those are harder to find. You know, you have lots of people yeah. to talk to. But I, like, I guess my general read on this stuff is that, I, I don't know, I wonder about it. Like it, to me, I think it wouldn't shock me if in many markets, including St. Louis and, and Louisiana and Tennessee and Arkansas, it wouldn't surprise me if at some point after COVID, the number of deals go down. I mean, and what I do think is it's cyclical. So you see this, you see this all the time. If you look at 10 years of data in every market, you definitely see number of deals and total deal volume go up, then you see it drop. Oftentimes it's because that there's like a small number of companies that are getting a, the lion's share of later stage rounds, right? And there's a buildup, a bunch of those companies go away, a couple make it, and then there's like a rebuilding year. So most of the time when you look at these trend lines, it goes like this. And as long as the overall is up, I think that's what's important. And, and, I, and I think that's, uh, that's generally, so like in 2019 and 2020, the total amount of money raised went down people probably got a little conservative in the amount that they were writing, but they probably like all the, all the companies that had funding that needed a little bit extra probably got it to weather the storm that happened in the recession in Silicon Valley. It happened. Uh, that's happened in Louisiana a couple of times. My bet is that's what that blip means here. And, and it's quite possible in 2021, 2022, things will go back and exceed the number of deals in 2018, 2019. But look, it's something I think about a lot. I think, I think in general, venture markets and ecosystems have had a big boost over the last 10 years. I think there's reshuffling going on. I see that in a lot of markets too, where you know there's different, different organizations are subsuming other ones and the dynamics are changing. Funds are either successfully raising a lot more money for another rounds or, or maybe they're not. Um, you know, we've seen a tremendous amount in entrepreneurial activity and investor activity over the decades since the Great Recession. I don't know what happens after COVID. That's the thing we'll have to look sure. at. A couple more questions we can squeeze in here. Uh, the first one, if, if you were advising the current administration on sustainable economic growth strategies, what percentage would come through the VC ecosystem? I don't know. I have to punt on that. I, I haven't that's, got- that's fair. That's fair. I, I, yeah. I, 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 don't, I never anticipated being asked to uh, advise the current administration. <laughs> 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 I, that's a good one. I will think about it. Um, yeah, and that, and that last one, I think that's a great one. The last question there yeah. um, from Vicky is, you know, crowdfunding, obviously, with the law changes a couple of years ago, has become a popular topic and thing people pursue. You know, what does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's a great, another great option. So, like, I, I think for me, none of these things should ever be off the table. Um, it, it's all, it's all situational. So, we, I had a client many years ago called Dinner Lab, which at the time it did the crowdfunding round was one of the first really high profile, um, like nationally televised 506C deals. And 506C is a general solicitation rule where you can announce that you're fundraising, but you have to verify that your investors are accredited. It was the first viable crowdfunding option after um, that these, thing, these measures were put into place. And it was a success. I mean, by any measure, they got national coverage on CBS News and they got tons of investor interest. They raised about a million plus, I think, from their, their like members across the nation. But most importantly is it got them their like lead VC investor um, at the time. And, and I think that's important. So I think if you're a company that has a broad user base or membership base or something, or you're pretty high profile, without spending a lot of money, you can employ certain crowdfunding techniques as a really big supplement to your other fundraising strategies. If you are a company that has a limited budget, limited uh, number of people, it's going to be really hard for you to succeed there. Like the only way I think you'll succeed is if you 
come up with a budget to market it. Or if you have like somebody on these platforms that love your company and idea and they directly market it to their personal investors, which is the same way it works in the private world. So I, I think it really depends. It's definitely not helping companies who like just don't have any traction, don't have any connections, don't already have a, a big base in my experience. How does crowdfunding differ if you end up with investors that are international? I mean, there's different regulatory issues with with sales of stock internationally. It's way too dense of a topic to go in at, into here, but um, I, I haven't really worked with anybody that's like focusing on attracting foreign investors because it, it's expensive. So, I mean, the bottom line is, like if you're a US based startup and you want to crowdfund internationally, a lot of people were doing this a couple of years ago in the ICO craze. I don't know if y'all remember that, but everybody was raising tokens everywhere. And then a bunch of people got in trouble with the SEC. So probably don't do that. <laughs> do that but I'm yeah. Not sure. yeah, I think so. Connie just shared our, our map up there as well for the Carestone sponsors. So everybody be sure to check that out. And, and I will say, you know, of all the, to reiterate something that Mark said earlier that I think is especially important for those early stage companies, it's going into fundraising or thinking about your fundraising strategy with information, with this knowledge, with this data that Carestone is putting together. In my years of working with startup companies, very few look at this broader picture before they start, and most of them start in the dark. Um, and unfortunately, that's not where you want to be, right? Any, any time that I coach people on negotiation, the number one tool you can have before you start something is just as much knowledge as possible, right? So be sure you're doing your research and, and using that to drive uh, this conversation and talking to Mark and talking to Kara Stone and, and using the tools on their website uh, as part of that conversation if you're, if you're looking at fundraising. And can I ask one more question? Do we have time for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, can you go to the slide where you had um, the... That when you were that you had up when you talked about percentage of ownership at the founder level, um, I think you had the bar chart. I was just curious what you're seeing. Those were mostly um, like traditional tech, or if there's biotech in there. I, I would have thought like the percentages you were throwing out sounded to me, and I I was involved on the inside of a biotech uh, yeah. deal, early deal, and then I've been you know on the edges of all the <laughs> i10 companies in the very different space. But the 46 percent. I mean, in a biotech world, that's, I mean, like you're, you're going to, you're, you end up owning a lot less, a lot sooner, I think with the amounts of money that have to come in in order to move the needle at all. Um, and so, you know, with founders, you know, losing prefer any kind of preferred, you know, after the series A basically, you know, because they need the VC money to do anything. I think that's so, a fair point that in many cases, there's a different framework for particularly pharmaceutical, I think, deals. I, but I think with I think there's variation, right? At least in the ones I've been involved with, but between the environmental device company or diagnostics or, or something that just needs 510k clearance or applications or right. I think there's variation within those deals. For sure, this data set, there are probably more, there's more software companies than there are biotech companies in this. There's a much smaller number of biotech companies. By the way, like what, what it looks like to me on the industry breakdown of deals is probably what all of you expect on, on the call. I think it's, you know, we, we look at software basically as the largest followed very, very, very closely. If you lump in biopharma healthcare that they're like almost tied in the number of deals over 10 years, followed by like uh, mobile apps, you know, if you combine food and beverage e-commerce direct to consumer type businesses, that's probably next, followed by ag tech. So if you're taking really broad strokes, I mean, it's probably similar to what you all kind of intuitively know or see or track other ways. So I think that's consistent. Um, that, that, that stuff is really hard too. Like, I, and that's, that's one of the cool things about Silicon Valley or New York is that you can drill down like in all of the, you know, or Massachusetts, even like you can really get deep into what are all the biotech deals doing? Like, you know, versus like a lot of these other markets. Yeah, I always struggle. Like, do you do we throw them all together or do we start looking at them separately? I mean, it, you probably do both to be really informed, but we don't have 50 of every category. So. 
And just one nice. more clarification, when you were talking about Missouri, these are Missouri data, what determines that somebody is Missouri? Is it, is it where their main headquarters is, where they're incorporated? Yeah, that's how Missouri, we're looking. Or? Yeah, we're looking at main, main, like main reported headquarters location. We're not really like, you know, like an economic development group might do more to track that, but that's, that's pretty much what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because we're all incorporated in Delaware, right? So you know, you would get zero data points if yeah you looked at the ones incorporated in Missouri. Like what we're seeing tons of is like a lot of companies in Louisiana. They have their New Orleans office, but then they like have a New York or Silicon Valley office too, or sometimes Austin. Um, I don't know if that's happening there, but that's pretty common here. So even even determining that these days is kind of like questionable. I know all these. Yeah. Founders apartments in both places i'm not really sure where they are so I, yeah. well, in the days of mobile workforce too right now like where where is a company based right is going to become even more fluid i feel like yeah you know. yeah and i i think i i hope and i think like i like being active in multiple markets i, I i'm starting to see like there's there's a number of, of founders here in the world that are from st louis that, that are living here now whether or not they stay here or not they came from the east coast or west coast during covid right i think that's something we track at the fund level. Like what do migration patterns look like? If you go back to the great recession, I can tell you from experience. I mean, you look down the street, everybody had a moving truck and moved back to wherever they're from. And that's happening again here. That happened in the last two years. We'll see it. We'll see in the number of deals. So it's possible that Missouri and Louisiana and some of these others go up in numbers over the next couple of years. If all of the local investors keep supporting funds and groups that help them. Right. I think that could happen. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, thanks so much, Mark, for coming and presenting. Uh, there's one final question there, which is, is there ever too much data? My, my opinion on that is, is there is analysis paralysis if you're not careful. So, you know, talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about along with the data. Uh, you have any quick thoughts there, Mark? Well, I think everybody can probably talk. I'm pretty opinionated, but even those opinions are subject to change. But I think that's the point of this. Use the data to, to make, to take some positions and, um, and use it to check your immediate reactions and instincts. I think that's what it's there for. I think, I think you're right, you can go nuts. And, and as you can tell, or I, my position on this is like, no one should go nuts on exactly like where they are in that 10 to 12% differential on evaluation. Right. Like people need to get there, get a deal done and get to business, which is what this is right. all about. And, and that's right. I'm with you. Too much data could be a pain. <laughs> well, thanks so much again, Mark uh, and Kara Stone and everybody for joining. Uh, last but not least, Paul is going to share some upcoming news stories in the chat with for the state that he's working on. So check that out. Um, and, you know, feel free to reach out to, to I-10 if any of you guys are looking for kind of the first step into this ecosystem and how you do your, your wayfinding into uh, launching your innovative ideas and company. And uh, we will look forward to, you know, seeing some of you back here weekly, but seeing you guys in a two month at our uh, next, at our second <laughs> Tuesday event in, in two months. Um, yeah, and we will uh, go from there. So thank you guys for joining so much.